Good evening, everyone. It's uh, good to be here tonight. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. I hope that you are well and that you've had a good week this week. Uh, and I just tell you, I look forward to the day that we're able to uh, get past all of this. We're able to come up in our building here and meet again. Um, and just, it's going to be a wonderful time and a wonderful time of celebration and worship. But until then, we'll do the best that we can. And I wanted to tell you about one change. Uh, by the way, you can go ahead and open to Judges chapter 6 tonight. Judges chapter 6 is where we'll be looking to and studying for this Bible study. But I wanted to tell you about a transition real quick uh, that we're making. Um, we are transitioning and moving all of our live online premiere stuff to YouTube. We're moving from Facebook to YouTube. And so I uh, want to just let you know about that change. It's a lot. I mean, it's going to put everything, all of our Sunday school classes, which we'll have four this weekend. Um, we will have Brother Mitch Stone teaching the young adult. We'll have Brother Lewis Tull teaching the regular adult quarterly. Uh, we'll have uh, Miss Rhonda Stone teaching our teenage class and older kids. And then Amber Coburn will be teaching uh, an elementary level uh, class Sunday school lesson uh, and so all of these will be able to you'll find them on YouTube make sure you go to our channel if you have not that's Austin Chapel Missionary Baptist Church and uh, make sure you go there and you like uh, subscribe to our channel it'll alert you you can get reminders uh, but all of these Sunday school classes will be premiering at 945 on this Sunday on YouTube uh, they'll still be shared somewhat through Facebook, but you'll just have to click on the link. It'll carry you right to YouTube. So please let me know if you have any questions about this. Our regular service is Sunday. We'll premiere at 1045 a.m. and 6 p.m. Uh, so remember this and let me know if you have any questions. Also, very quickly, I wanted to mention this uh, because we've received some uh, questions about tithes and offerings again. Again, there's several ways that you can do that. Uh, number one, you can mail your check here to the uh, to the office. That's 9668 FM 1840, DeKalb, Texas. Uh, number two, you can give online by texting ACNBC to 22525. Or number three, you can um, drop that off at the State Bank of DeKalb, DeKalb location and ask that to be given to Renee. Or you can drop it by the office here. Uh, so let us know if there's any way we can help with that. Let us know if you have any questions. And uh, so that's kind of how we're handling that. Now to the Word of God tonight for our Bible study, Judges chapter 6. Uh, what we're going to be talking about tonight is the God of peace or Jehovah Shalom. And uh, this, is a, this is a study that I have been doing for probably eight weeks now. And uh, it's just awesome how God knows exactly what we need and gives us that when we need it. Uh, but this is actually a series of lessons that I found um, in the church office. And these are from 2006. But I said, man, I just feel like I need to teach these. We need to go through these. I really liked um, everything about those lessons. Uh, and so we didn't know what we would be dealing with. We didn't know what would be going on, on in the world. But God knew it. And God knew that we needed them at this time. And so uh, what a tremendous blessing that is. Uh, but tonight, as I said, we're going to look in Judges chapter 6. I want you to, let's begin reading in verse 6 uh, to kind of catch you up on this. We know that Israel, they're being oppressed right now by a group of people called the Midianites. And uh, the Midianites were a great enemy of them for several years. Uh, but notice in verse 6 what God says. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt, and I brought you forth out of the house of bondage and so God's telling them I've given you all of these blessings uh, I have I brought you out I delivered you from this bondage that you were in and in verse 9 he says and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drove them out from before you and gave you their land 
And so God says, look, I did all of this for you. I, uh, I blessed you. I gave you the ability. Uh, I, I won the victory for you, and you conquered this land. But look with me in verse 10. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Uh, and so we find a time of rebellion here. And uh, by the way, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9, while you're finding your places, that, I mean, you don't have to go to there. Let me just read to you what Paul said in Philippians 4 9. He said, Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. And so Paul called him the God of peace. Uh, and this is a time of turmoil. This is a time of oppression. This is a time of trouble for Israel in Judges chapter 6. But notice down in verse 22. The Bible says, And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee. God says, I'm going to give you peace. How can God make a promise that he'll give peace? Well, because he is the author of peace. He is the source of peace. And if we continue reading, he says, fear not, you're not going to die. Verse 24, then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. Jehovah Shalom. And that what that means is the Lord, the God of peace. Uh, and so as we as we look into this story, we know that Gideon, he lived in a very difficult time. He lived in a very trying time uh, in Israel's history. In fact, in Judges chapter 17 and verse 6, this time in history, uh, in Israel's history, was determined like this. It was described like this, that uh, every man did what was right in his own eyes. Uh, they did evil continually. They did things according to their way. And listen, when mankind begins to do things according to our way and not according to God's way, we're in for a lot of trouble. We're in for some troubled times. Uh, and so they had, they, had, they had rejected God and they were living in rebellion against God. Uh, they were trying God. They were doing what they thought was right in their own eyes. And because of this rebellious spirit, what we find God doing, God allows them to go into this oppression and they face this oppression. And uh, what we find with Israel is just this vicious cycle. What they would do, they would rebel against God. They would enjoy the blessings of God. Then they would rebel against God, and God would send judgment. Look in verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And so notice here, they're not there by accident. They're there because this is the judgment of God. Look in verse 2. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Why did their hand prevail? It's not necessarily because they had a greater army, a stronger army, uh, a more powerful army, but it is because this was the Lord's doing. And God is bringing judgment on them because they're living in rebellion. And so this cycle, what we would see Israel do at that time when they would be oppressed, what would they do? They would cry out to God. They would call on God to help them and to deliver them, and they would repent of their ways, and they would repent of their sin. And so God would send a judge that would bring to them deliverance at that time. And uh, they would just repeat that cycle, rebellion, judgment, uh, then repenting, and God blessing, and God delivering them again. Uh, it was just a continuous cycle. And the primary oppressing nation in Gideon's time were the Midianites. Uh, it was Midian here. And after Moses... Uh, Midian was a, con a constant and consistent enemy against Israel. At this time, they had driven Israel out of their fields, out of their flocks, and they had driven them up into the hill country, and uh, they had confiscated their crops, they had confiscated their flocks. And so think about that. They had no food, they had no livelihood at this time in their lives. They're just up doing the best they can in this hill country. They were left desolate for years in this country, and now God comes to deliver them. And I am so thankful today that, you know, even, even after our rebellion and even after our rejection of God, 
that when we get to a point that we come to God and we repent and we cry out to him that he is still a God of grace, he is still a God of mercy, and God is a God of restoration. God is a God that brings us back together with him in a right relationship. And so I'm thankful for that mercy and that peace of God. And so we notice here that uh, God's ultimate expression, think about this, his ultimate expression of peace uh, is the cross of Calvary, and it will come through Jesus Christ. The way to have true peace comes through Christ and comes through his offering there. And so Gideon here in verse 24, he builds an altar, and he begins to worship God. And what he is declaring is that he accepts that Jehovah is the source of all peace, that he is the giver of all peace. And so peace is a great need of our present world. Peace is a great need of our present generation. Now, we understand there's not going to be an absolute peace um, until the Lord deems it to be. Uh, we know the scriptures, and we know that the scriptures teach about a false peace and a false time of peace. Uh, but the problem is, while the world calls for peace and the world calls for safety, uh, it brings absolutely nothing. And nothing that man can do can bring real peace. Nothing that government can do can produce peace and bring any lasting peace. You remember what Jesus said in John chapter 16 and verse 33? He said, look, in this world you will have tribulation. You're going to have trials. You're going to have problems. Uh, but he says, in me you can find peace. In me rejoice because I have overcome the world. And so he tells us, in me you can enjoy peace. And listen, child of God, tonight, <clears throat> if the, while the world crumbles around us, we can be good testimonies of God and we can live in peace. We can have the peace of God. We can have peace with God. And so the world may claim to want peace, but the world can't produce peace. Governments can't. Man can't. Because God is the only source of peace. And that's why Gideon here, he makes this, this altar and he proclaims Jehovah Shalom, the Lord God, our peace. And so what we want to talk about in this lesson tonight is how does God bring peace? How does God produce peace? And uh, the first way that he does that is he gives peace in his relationship with man. He gives peace in his relationship with man. And uh, our natural nature is not a nature of peace. Naturally, we don't have peace. Naturally, we don't have peace with God. Naturally, we are sinners. Naturally, we are enemies of God. And we are at enmity with God. And we are literally, we are at war with God. And we are separated from God because we are sinners. Now, let me say this. We are... Uh, we don't, we're not sinners because we sin, uh, but we sin because we're sinners. And so an illustration of this is two nations or two people who are constantly in, in conflict. They're constantly fighting. They're constantly at war with one another. Uh, there's constant tension between these two people or this, these two nations. Uh, and they are just, they're constantly going at it. Now, the illustration falls short when we bring God into it because there is a war between us and God. But listen, God's not adding to that war. In fact, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, it talks about how God is hes patient and uh, he is long-suffering and he's not willing that any should perish but that all come to the, to the knowledge of repentance. And so God wants peace. Listen to me. God wants to have peace with you. God wants peace in your life. Uh, God wants to give peace. But we learn more about that. It only comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. God wants to repair the separation. He wants to repair the breach between man and between God. So how is that repaired? And think about, think about holy God uh, compared to fallen man. Uh, God is 100% holy. God is 100% good. He's 100% right. While mankind is 100% sinful by our nature. Uh, now when we hear that, the world doesn't like to hear that they are 100% sinful by nature. 
Uh, the world doesn't like to hear it. Mankind doesn't like to hear it. Uh, we don't even like to hear that we are sinful by nature uh, in that way. But when we consider man and we consider uh, the sinfulness of men and the fallen world that we live and the evil that is going on uh, and, and how mankind is acting towards one another, when we consider that, we see what? Man is 100% sinful. We are sinners. And uh, there's, there's a couple different views that I want to give to you about how people view sinners and view mankind. Uh, there's the tolerant worldview. And the worldview says this. It says that in every person, in every man, there is a kernel of goodness. And you just need to water that kernel. Uh, you need to take care of that seed. You need to hone in on that kernel of goodness. You need to hone in on what's going on there. Uh, and you need to seek to improve that little bit of goodness. And then if you'll just try really hard to improve that goodness, uh, then that person must be acceptable to whatever supreme being it is in the world. That's the, that's the view of mankind. Uh, that's the world view. But let me tell you the Bible view, okay? The Bible view is this, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. The Bible view uh, is that there is none that doeth good, no, not one. There's none that seeketh after God. The Bible view goes like this, that our righteousness is... Or it's as filthy rags in the sight of Almighty God. And so when God is so great and God is so wonderful and God is so holy and man being so small and man being so sinful, notice how far these two are apart. Uh, they, are, they are so far apart. And so uh, how do you bring these two together if they're so different and they're so far apart and they're separated by sin? How can there ever be reconciliation? Is there hope? Can, can man experience peace? Can there be peace between God and between man? Well, yes, there can. And we enter, God enters into this equation. Uh, peace with God is offered through the sacrifice of the Son of God. Uh, and you think about the gospel message, how that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, born uh, some 2,000 years ago. He grew and he lived and the Bible teaches us that he never, he never committed any sin, that he was the sinless son of God. And he was brought before trial, and he was, uh, his sentence was to be crucified among sinners, to be crucified the, the, the worst death possible and the most humiliating de death possible. And so think about it. As Jesus Christ hangs uh, on the cross of Calvary, he is... He is in between a holy and a righteous heavenly father, a holy and a righteous God, and fallen sinful man. He is, he is the one that stands between. He is the one who bridges that gap. And we learn that his sacrifice satisfied the righteous and the holy demands of Almighty God. Uh, peace has been offered through this relationship with God. Uh, because he sat, he satisfied the righteous demands of God. So I want you to think about that for a moment. Here's Christ. He is, he is in between holy God, fallen man. And when we accept Christ, when we, uh, what he offers to us is our rags in exchange for his riches, our rags in exchange for for his righteousness. And what that means is this, y'all. One of these days when we stand before him in judgment, uh, he's not going to see us for our sinful nature. He's going to see us. He's going to see the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ, uh, because that righteousness covers us when we accept Christ, when we are born again, when we, uh, when we put our faith and our trust in Christ Jesus and in Christ alone. And so we receive this relationship when we receive Christ. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Paul says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Through faith. He says, through our belief, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so though we're not naturally at peace with God, this can change. That's what these scriptures teach us. 
What was constant war and what was a rebellion uh, can become peace and safety. But it can only happen when we do it God's way. It can only happen when we go to God and we uh, get this relationship. It can only happen God's way. Listen, we don't get to God any way that we want to. You don't get to God because you try your best and you use your best effort. You don't get to God because uh, your religion. We don't get to God because of our rituals or trying to do good works. We get to God on the terms that he has said. We get to God by going the way the word of God tells us to. And so he wants to give a peaceful relationship and he will give one through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. We can have peace with God. But I want you to notice, secondly, he also gives peace in his response to man. And so this peace that we have made with God when we come to Christ in salvation, this peace is not a momentary occurrence. It's not just for a short span of time, but this is a lasting peace. It's a peace that goes on through our life. It goes on day to day. Notice the example with Gideon. Gideon here, uh, he... He received peace through God's response to him. And so notice when we when we find Gideon, when we first meet him in verse 11, Gideon is cowering in fear at the bottom of the hill. Uh, he is threshing wheat. Verse 11 tells us, it says here, And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. So notice here, he's in such oppression that he is at the bottom of a hill by a winepress and he is threshing wheat. Now, this is strange because you didn't thresh wheat at the bottom of the hill. How do we know it was the bottom of the hill? Because it was by a winepress. But notice they, they would thresh wheat at the top of a hill because they would throw the wheat up and then the wind would catch the chaff. It would drive that chaff away and what remained was the good wheat. And so that's where they would normally thresh it. But he's at the bottom where, where the wind really can't help him. Uh, it's of little value down there. It's of little help down there. But he's there because they're being oppressed. And he's there because he's afraid. And he doesn't have much to eat. And so he's trying to do the best that he can. And notice in verse 12 what God calls him. Verse 12, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee. And he looks at him and he says, Thou mighty man of valor. You, you mighty warrior. And I'm sure Gideon looks at himself and he's like, Are you talking to me? This can't be, this can't be God talking to me. And so notice here, God's not mocking Gideon when he calls him a mighty man of valor. But here's the, here's the truth of it. He can see something in Gideon that Gideon can't even see yet. He can see into the heart and he can see right through us. And he saw that Gideon was the, the, the proper candidate to lead his people at this time in this circumstance. Uh, Gideon, he didn't even see it. Look with me in verse 13. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord... If the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. So notice the troubled spirit that Gideon has here. What's Gideon doing? He's trying to process this. He's trying to figure out exactly what all is going on. He's trying to, he's trying to do the best he can to process this situation, just like we do when we get in a situation like this. We try to process it. We, and he's, he's asking here, why is this happening to us? In verse 14, And the Lord looked on him and said, Go, in this thou might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And Gideon says, God, I don't know if you sent me or not. Uh, but look in verse 15. And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And so he begins to tell God, God, you don't know who you're choosing here. I mean, you don't know who you're calling a mighty man of valor. I come from the poorest family. I come, I'm the poorest of those. I mean, we're not, we're not warriors, God. Uh, I'm not the man for the job. I'm not the guy that you want to do this and handle this situation. Uh, and so notice in verse 16, 
uh, he, he says, And the Lord said unto him, Surely I'll be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And said, God says, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it through you. And so he sees something that Gideon didn't even see. Can we identify with that today? Can you identify with that? Has God ever laid something on your heart? Has God ever given you a job, a task, a work to do? And so at that moment, you begin to try to process all of this. And you begin to tell God why he has messed up by choosing you. Why you are not the person for the job. And you begin to... You begin to maybe even make an excuse. And I'm saying, what I'm talking about is like a for real, this is God leading you. God wants you to do something. Uh, you know, this is not just bad pizza or something like that. This is, this is God has laid this on your heart. And so uh, we're, we begin to get scared. We begin to be filled with fear. And we begin to say, God, can't you figure out someone else that's better than me to do this? Can't you figure out someone else that, could do this job better and uh so we begin to tell god you know god i really can't uh i i can't do this job i can't teach this class i can't fill this position uh but let me tell you god looks through what we see and he looks into the hearts of people i'm going to give you another example in first samuel chapter 16 first samuel chapter 16 verses 1 through 6 this is when god is going to to choose a new king and uh, so he, he tells in, in verse 1 here, it says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I rejected him from reigning over Israel? For thine, Fill thine horn with oil, and go, I'll send thee to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. So God tells Samuel here, he says, Look, you need to go find Jesse. Uh, one of his boys is going to be the new king, and I'll show you which one of his boys will be the king. And so... Samuel in verse 2, he says, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he's going to kill me. The Lord says, take a heifer with you and go and sacrifice to the Lord. And so verse 3, he calls Jesse to this sacrifice. Um, and uh, he comes into town. And notice in verse 6, and it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him when Samuel lays his eyes on this oldest son of Jesse Samuel says this is him we found our new king <laughs> listen God doesn't God doesn't work the way that we work and what we learn about this oldest son he's handsome he's tall he's very strong he looks like a king he fits the part he looks and he fits the mold and maybe you know he might serve as a good Disney character uh, but he's not God's chosen man to be the new king. And look with me in verse 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I've refused him. For the Lord seeth uh, not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. The Lord looks on the heart. And so God says, Samuel, is not this in, this in the man. And so he says, Jesse, bring out your other boys. And so he brings out all those boys. And God says, no, no, no. And and uh, towards the end of this, uh, Samuel says, Jesse, do you have any more boys? Is this all your children? And Jesse says, matter of fact, I do. I've got a shepherd boy. He's tending flock over there on the backside. Look in verse 11. Samuel says, go get him. Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, and with all of a beautiful countenance, and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. God says, That's the man. That's the man that I want. Why did God choose David? Because God saw something in David that he wanted to use. God had a plan for David's life. He, he, a shepherd boy, most people would have passed on, but God responds and God says he's the man. And later on, God, God could look into his heart and God said this about David. He is a man after my own heart. And so... Uh, He's a man who's focused on me, and uh, he's a man uh, who I want. And so God responded here, and God still responds in peace to those who call on him. When we go through difficulties, God gives to us peace. Uh, God, God grants us that peace to those who call on him. When we go through difficulties, uh, 
notice in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11. <clears throat> Listen to what Paul says here in this passage of Scripture. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. He says, live in peace. Um, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. The God of love and and peace. And so when we go through our difficulties, listen, God gives to us peace. If if uh, if we will just say, okay, God, God will give to us that peace. And then thirdly, I want you to notice this. Uh, thirdly, notice he gives peace in his requirements for man. Uh, and God dealt with him on the basis of him being Jehovah, Shalom, uh, the Lord our peace. Think about this. Gideon still had requirements from God. Gideon still had a special work that God wanted him to do. And so it began with taking a stand. It began with taking a stand against false gods of his family. Think about how hard that would have been. It began with taking a stand against false gods, not only of his family, but also in the city. And it began, uh, God required him to cut down the grove of idols. And he also had to break down the sacrificial altar that was dedicated to Baal. Man, this would have been a very difficult thing to do. But Gideon does it, and Gideon responds in faith. And Gideon is doing what God wants him to do. Is it, is it easy? No. It, it was a difficult thing, but it was necessary if God was going to bring peace ultimately and deliver his people. Uh, Gideon had to go through this, and he had to do these difficult things. They needed to trust in God, Jehovah God, not in these false gods or not in anything else. Listen, today we need to be trusting in God, not in money or government or man. We need to put all of our faith in Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace in these difficult times. And so it was difficult, but ultimately it brought peace to Israel. And uh, a lot of times when God calls us to certain works, uh, it brings controversy. Uh, when, when we just sit out there and we say, okay, this is what God wants me to do. And we know that, listen, the church may even question uh, what we're doing. Uh, church members may question what we're doing. Other believers, our family may wonder what we're doing uh, when we begin to do the work that God calls us to. Uh, others may look at it and they may say, I wonder if this will work. This will never work. He, th that, that idea, he's going to fall flat on his face. But listen, here's the truth. If it is of God, it will work. If it's of God, it will work. And so we learn here in chapter 7 that Gideon takes an army against an innumerable foe. And we know you can look at chapter 7, verse 3 there. But there it says, Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. And so Gideon has an army of over thirty thousand men. God says that's too many. And so they send 22,000 home. He's left with 10,000. God says that's still too many. And God whittles this army down to 300 people, 300 soldiers, 300 men. Uh, imagine how Gideon <laughs> must have felt. Imagine how the people must have responded when God does this and he whittles th this army down. Think about that. Uh, think about what have been, what might have gone through their minds. Surely some of them said, Gideon, this is impossible. But that was the whole point. <laughs> God, God wanted to do something. God wanted them all to know that he was the one that delivered Israel. It wasn't because Gideon uh, was a great warrior. It wasn't because Israel's army was bigger. It wasn't because they had the latest technology. It was because God delivered them out of the hand of their enemies. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is our peace. It was hard uh, for a time, but in the end, it brought peace. And I encourage you, uh, if you hadn't looked at that in a while, read Judges chapter 7. 
And notice how God handles that. Only God can get the credit from what happens uh, in that battle. But you go read that because we just, time's sake, we can't do that. But listen, when we listen to God and we do what He requires, it may bring some uncomfortable situations. It may bring some people laughing at us, doubting at us, saying, you know, this will never work. Uh, but we will have peace. And uh, let me let me just tell you this: we don't have to uh, we don't have to please everyone. The only one we have to please is Almighty God. And uh, if He's pleased with our life, if He's pleased with our work, if He's pleased with what we're doing for Him, then listen, we're going to have that peace. We're going to have the peace that God is talking about here when we do what He has commanded us to do. And so the world promises peace. But really, it delivers none. It delivers no lasting peace. And the reason is, is this, because God has a patent. He's got a patent on peace. Uh, you know, you can't go to Walmart and buy peace. You can't get on Amazon and add peace to your cart and it be shipped to you the next day. Peace only comes from God. He is the source of all peace. And uh, he holds the market on peace. You're not going to find true lasting peace anywhere else. And we can have that peace. We can have peace with God tonight. And then once we have peace with God, we can have the peace of God. Uh, we can have that peace that passes all human understanding. Have you ever experienced that? I know that I have. Uh, it's a peace that you don't even understand why you have peace at this time. And it's a marvelous thing. And it's all because of Jehovah Shalom. It's all because of God our peace. And, but here's the thing, we'll never have the peace of God until first we have peace with God. Um, and then the God of all peace will be with us. Uh, and so you've got to have peace with God. Then you can experience the peace of God. And then the God of all peace, as the Bible says, will be with us. And so I want to encourage you tonight that he is still the Prince of Peace. And this peace can be ours if we will only trust him. Only trust Him now. Uh, this We can experience the peace of Jehovah Shalom, and it is a wonderful thing. So tonight, I, as we get ready to close, uh, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We just thank you for the peace that is provided through faith in Jesus Christ. And Lord, it's our prayer tonight, if there's one person here that doesn't have peace with you, that tonight they would make peace with you, that they would accept what Christ did on the cross, that they would put all of their faith and call on you to save them tonight. Lord, I pray for the person that's troubled tonight in their spirit, God, that saved person that's watching, I pray that you would just bring a peace and a calm around them. Lord, may we as your people seek this peace in our lives. May we exhibit this peace, and God, may we be a great testimony to what this peace looks like even in a world that is so full of chaos god we love you we praise you we pray for those that are on our hearts and on our prayer lists we lift them up to you and god we just pray uh, that you would receive honor and glory from everything that we do it's in the name of jesus we pray amen all right thank you uh for tuning in tonight and uh, like I say, be praying for one another. Um, stay connected. Stay in contact with one another. Um, look for, just look for opportunities that we can still serve God in these times that we live. I love y'all. God bless you. We'll see you this coming Sunday.